So indeed, today is the third of four sermons on dogs, how they help us understand God a little bit better, our relationship with God, and our relationship with one another. And as promised, you're about to witness the third of four installments of The Dogs of Manchester United Methodist. Hit it! Now, I think it's pretty safe to say that you are just looking at the sons and daughters of the members here. I mean, these, we treat dogs like they're part of the family. With our dog, Jake the Beagle, well, whenever he uh, has his vet bills, we take it out of the family health fund because he's family. But he's family only because of our emotional attachment. You know what I mean. Your dogs are emotionally attached, and that's why they're family, but biologically, they're not human. They do not have opposable thumbs or really big brains. They are of the canine family, not the homo sapien family. And the thing about that is, That means that I believe dogs can really perceive things in a way that either A, we can't, or B, it's difficult for us to. Extrasensory perception, if you will. And let me give you an example. Just after Barb and I got married, lo, 27 years ago, shortly after that, we adopted a dog from the Humane Society. It was, she was a German Shepherd mix mutt and we called her Tilly. Here are a couple of shots of Tilly. Upper left, you can see her favorite activity of drinking from the bird bath. I have no idea why, but she liked doing that. And the lower picture, you can see the day that we brought little Cameron home from the, uh, from the hospital. And you can tell both Cam and I have not changed in 27 years, 20 some odd years. Tilly was a very sweet dog. And I remember, though, a few weeks after getting her, I went home and was talking with Barb, debriefing as married couples do about the day, when she paused and she said, well, maybe this will be a good time to let you know that little thing that Tilly did. Those are words to this day that shock me. What little thing? Well, as a backdrop, when I moved from bachelorhood to married status, I brought with me my one prized possession, this big chair, this overstuffed chair with a matching ottoman that just sitting in it, you go, huh, have you had chairs like that? And no matter what you went through the day, you just sit in it and you just relax. All the cares just stream away. It was my happy chair. And it was made of leather. Are you starting to put this together? What little thing? Well, Tilly chewed a small hole in the back of your chair. 
I shot up like a Roman candle. Went to it. And you could have driven a truck through the hole. <laughs> and I go out, and I can't even control myself. I, I let out this primal howl of pain, angst, emotional distress, fill in the blank, an existential dilemma. Now, had I had a cat, the cat would have just looked at me having this meltdown, twitched his tail and said, ha, human. But Tilly sensed my hurt, my agony, my existential angst, and I've never before seen this. She put her tail between her legs, literally, and tiptoed down the stairs, away. I mean, she was safe anyway, but she felt the pain, and somehow she felt that she had caused it. Yes, she was family. That's why you, you just sort of sense that. And you all know what I mean. You could probably tell similar stories about how, if you have a dog, past or present, how that dog has sensed what you were going through without you even communicating. As if you could communicate, I guess, that with the dog. One of uh, you sent a story in just this past week, I think, that illustrates it so very well. The other day, my wife and I were sitting in the family room, and she was relating the concern she has with her elderly mother and what appears to be medical issues. A little while into this, my wife starts to cry, and our dog immediately jumps onto her lap and goes to kissing her. She hugs the dog, and it makes the tears ease up. I could not have done a better job than our dog. This intense emotional connection that humans and canines have, actually, you might have seen it in your own life, but it's been scientifically studied because there's a lot of evidence out there that backs it up. A biochemist in England by the name of Rupert Sheldrake wrote a book titled, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home and Other Unexplained Powers of Animals. They do not have short book titles in England. And he had this to say, Dr. Sheldrake, in an interview. Watch. Many dogs know when their owners are coming home. Cats do it too, and a number of other animals, occasionally rabbits, guinea pigs, uh, quite often parrots and other domestic animals do this. They seem to anticipate the arrival of the person by going and waiting at a door or window, or in the case of parrots, they sometimes actually announce verbally who's going to come. They wait, they sometimes know 10 minutes or more in advance. Um, the reason I think it's telepathic is because we've actually done experiments to test this. The obvious standard armchair skeptical explanations are that it's just routine timings, a biological clock, clues given by people at home, um, sounds of familiar car engines, that kind of thing. Um, so what we've done is experiments where people go at least five miles away, they come home at random times that they're not, they don't know in advance, communicated to them by a telephone pager. They come home in taxis or other unfamiliar cars. No one at home knows when they're coming. The position where the animal waits is filmed continuously, so we have a con continuous video record the whole time they're out. Uh, this shows that uh, some dogs, not all, but some dogs reliably predict uh, the return of their owner over and over again in a way that's highly significant statistically that shows that uh, it must be something like telepathy. Uh, because it can't be explained in any of these other standard ways. So you might like to do some research with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake and follow that on YouTube or do a Google search. But it is fascinating, the control studies he's done, where the dog will sense a master coming when there are no obvious clues uh, for that. He said it was telepathy, and that makes me nervous. Sounds a little bit like New Age stuff. But something is going on. Something connects on an other than rational level between dogs and their owners. And I say all of this to set up the scripture that you're just about to hear. Tim is going to read a story where you would swear that Jesus has this similar type of telepathy 
this similar type of extrasensory perception to connect with what a person is going through. Tim. A man with a skin disease approached Jesus, fell to his knees, and begged, If you want, you can make me clean. Incensed, Jesus reached out his hand, touched him, and said, I do want to. Be clean. Instantly, the skin disease left him, and he was clean. Sternly, Jesus sent him away, saying, Don't say anything to anyone. Instead, go and show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice for your cleansing that Moses commanded. This will be a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and started talking freely and spreading the news that Jesus wasn't, so that Jesus wasn't able to enter a town properly. He remained outside in deserted places, but people came to him from everywhere. Thank you. If you read that from Matthew's account, you would see a big difference. Matthew's account of this same healing says that a leper comes up to Jesus. Do, do you choose to heal me? Jesus says, yes, I choose, and heals him. But Mark's account, it's almost as if the source that gave this to Mark the source was looking at Jesus' face, his facial expressions, his words, how he spoke. Because, as the Common English Version Bible has it, incensed, sensing Jesus' feelings, incensed, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. Incensed. Not just Jesus saw him and healed him, but he is incensed. And furthermore, if you were to read most any other translation, it would not be incensed. It would say, and moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand. You read the Common English Bible, though, there's a footnote by incensed, and it says, the most ancient manuscripts, some of the most ancient manuscripts, have, have, yeah, they have the word that's translated angry really, really angry. Why was Jesus angry? What was he mad at? Who was he mad at? Uh, the, the leper for interrupting him on his busy day? Of course not. We, we know Jesus better than that. But could he have been angry at the forces that kept this man living a fraction of a life and not a full life? The leprosy, the, the genetic crapshoot, if you will, the throw of the dice that made it snake eyes for this poor man and that he had this disease that would, that would rot his flesh and make him then a social outcast. Maybe Jesus was angry at the society that would look at him not as someone who was suffering but someone to be avoided and they had leper colonies out, uh, uh, outside of town so that those people would not come close to them. Was Jesus mad at that? Was Jesus mad at the religious establishment that arrogantly and self-righteously said, yeah, you know why he has leprosy? He's a sinner. Maybe any or all of these reasons pumped up that anger, that fear, that, that, the, the emotion. And you can even tell that it was even more uh, stoked up by the way the man came to him, as Mark put it, that the man, this beggar, comes kneeling before him. Maybe you can even imagine that he's face down. And he says, if you choose, you can make me well. Because he wasn't sure. No one else would care. No one else gave him the time of day. I don't know if you will either, Jesus. If you choose. And the, the man's miserable, pitiable uh, demeanor must have just stoked up that anger even more. And Jesus essentially said, of course I choose. And then he went one step farther and he broke Judaic law and he gave that man something that he had not received for years. Not just healing, but Jesus touched him, touched an unclean sinner who could convey the leprosy to him, but he touched him, 
And the man felt that which he had never felt before. He felt the love that healed his body, healed his spirit, and enabled him to totally disobey Jesus. Don't tell anybody or I'll not be able to make it into town, okay? It'll be our secret. Yeah, right. Look, I live. I'm alive. I can be one of you. I can, be, I can have a family. I can be loved. I can be part of society. I can be well. All because Jesus was incensed and reached out and touched him. So friends, there are different images we can have of Jesus. Image of him as a good shepherd, kindly leading his flock. There's the image of Jesus as a rebel, standing up against the tyranny of, and the idolatry of Rome. There's the image of Jesus as a teacher, uh, Jesus as a miracle worker. But I want to give you a different image today. Having heard that story and how incensed he was and how he reached out and made that man whole again, I want to convey to you the image that Jesus is a wonderful guard dog. Sort of like that. Here's a dog defending the master against a vicious cat. But a guard dog. Someone who will be right beside the one who is hurting and growl. Feeling the anger mount that anybody would dare hurt the master. The leper was constricted by his pain and by his abandonment. What makes you the leper? What makes me the leper? What fear do we have? What anxiety do we have? What grief are we going through? What, what, uh, what hurt uh, within ourselves, self-doubt, guilt, what is it? Whatever it is, get into your mind's eye that Jesus is beside you, and he's like that dog. He's that loyal one who senses with that extrasensory perception exactly what you feel and is not going to abandon you and will growl at anything or anyone who will come to hurt you. Now, the unconditional love of God does not mean the unconditional approval of God. Because, friends, we bring a lot of stuff on ourselves. That's the way we are in life. And we do things that hurt ourselves and others. God doesn't approve of that, but God does love you regardless. And that watchdog, that guard dog of Jesus, the one who's incensed that anything would hurt you, that is the gospel. Because Jesus understands. Jesus understands that you and I say and do things that are often beyond our control. We are products of our genetics, of our environment, and of our experiences. That's just the way it is. That's who we are, and we're going to make mistakes. But the biggest mistake we can ever make is to think that Jesus holds our mistakes against us, that Jesus is some fundamentalist judge with a gavel that's going to point to you that you should have done better. No, Jesus is the one who is incensed and feels what you feel and said, I am with you. Take a breath, step back, and feel my presence. You can feel his presence in many ways. Maybe through a dog, maybe through a friend. But make no mistake, Jesus, who is moved by angry compassion on your behalf, will make himself and his message known. Back a, a few years ago, when I was a young seminarian, I remember, don't laugh, I remember that message of grace fresh for me at a critical time. It was one of those times, you know, when you start, a, 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 I guess, a, a new school or a new phase of your life, and you're far away from home, and all of these things are building up, and you see mistakes you've made. And one evening, I was basically confessing to an older seminarian. His name was Bob Sutherland, I remember. And he was a second career a seminary student. So he's older and been through the ranks a bit. And I was just pouring it out. I said, I was confused about the world. I confused about what I, my place in it, questioning my calling, my faith, you name it. He passed the Kleenex. We went on. 
And after I had a, a moment to breathe a little bit, I remember his words, and I wrote them down as best as I could remember them. And he said, with a lot of wisdom, lighten up. Lighten up, Greg. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're not perfect, and you'll probably never be perfect. God's grace cuts you some slack. When you let yourself be human and let yourself be loved for who you are and for how God made you, then you can find a better way to live. To this day, these words liberate my heart. That might be the gospel for you as well. Lighten up. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're not perfect, and you're never going to be perfect. God's grace cuts you some slack. When you let yourself be human and let yourself be loved for who you are and for how God made you, then you can find a better way to live. Each and every one of us is a leper. Each and every one of us will feel unworthy at times. Each and every one of us wonders if there's hope, and each and every one of us will wonder if anyone would ever choose really to love us. And just at those moments, we feel a touch and hear the Master. I choose be clean. 